the New Testament lesson from the book of Revelation. There are times in the book of Revelation where it takes a great deal of interpretation. But in chapter 21, verses 1 through 6, it's a little more apparent. The hope, the fulfillment. The entirety of scripture comes together in its fulfillment in chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. Listen. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice saying, See, the home of God is among mortals, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who is seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. He also said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we pray that amidst this scripture of yours, we will begin to have understanding about the fulfillment of your word and how it impacts our lives, our past, our present, and our future. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You can imagine John, a man of God, a man of faith, a prophet. We're not sure why he ended up on this island of Patmos, but what we do know is that Patmos was one of those islands where they stuck, the Roman Empire stuck its bad people, its criminals, its political dissidents, all of those people went to those little islands off in the Aegean Sea, off the mainland. And so you can just imagine John sitting there, he finds this flat rock, he lays down his parchment, and he begins to write. And as he's writing, he's thinking about all of the scriptures that have gone before him, that he has read. Some of hope, like Psalm 24. Remember, he probably only had the Hebrew Bible and maybe one little bit or two from the Gospels, maybe a part of a letter of Paul that he had heard before. But he would have remembered the Hebrew Scriptures. And he would have read all of those Psalms. And believe me, as I've been doing this devotional on all the Psalms, it's amazing how depressing they are. I never put them together into 151 of them before. Almost all of them are crying. They're agonizing. And so that's where John starts. He thinks about the emperor Domitian and how in some ways he was a good emperor. His father Flavius and his brother Titus had been emperors before him. Both of them had tried huge building campaigns, stretched the Roman dollar to the, and taxes to the point of almost bankruptcy for the entire Roman Empire. And Domitian, he tightens that belt, that belt strap, he brings the money back, he is able to provide a 25% raise to the Roman army that had not had any kind of raise in 100 years. Sounds pretty good. But he was an autocrat, which means he wanted unlimited power for himself. He would think nothing of murdering senators who spoke against him in any way. And he was especially frustrated with the Jews and especially the Jewish sect that called itself or were called Christians. Why? Because they were unpatriotic. Unpatriotic. Because for everything the Roman Empire has done for them, the Roman Empire has protected them. 
the Roman Empire had supported them. The Roman Empire put up with their rudeness, their different ways, and still they harbor resentment. All the empire asked of this sect, this Jewish sect, was to simply be patriotic and kneel before the emperor and, and uh, give honor. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with worshiping the emperor along with whatever god you want? The emperor even said, I'm not even as important a god as your god. I'll even give you that. But nope. And so Domitian said, that's enough. I'm going to come down hard against this in unpatriotic rabble we call Christians. And he did. Most of whom he executed. Others like John, sitting on his flat rock, writing on his parchment, he had cast away to the islands off into the Aegean Sea. And so here's John figuring out how to keep the faith together amidst all of this burden. He's watched relatives, he's heard of friends who have been murdered by Domitian in the army. And after you get a 25% raise, I'm sorry, you're pretty loyal. And so the army was very supportive of Domitian, and so they do whatever he wanted, including beheading, mutilating Christians. In the middle of all that agony and pain, John writes. And he writes in very colorful language, symbolic language, that is not to be taken literally, Hal Lindsey and the rest of you horde that write about the end time garbage. That's what it is. They wrote, John wrote, talking in numerology, where the number 12 is important, the number 10 is important, the number 3 is important. The so that the Roman people, if they got his message, would not understand it. The colors of red and white and black were important because the Christians would understand it like a code. And if the Roman army and the others did received it, they wouldn't know that they were talking about the Roman Empire. When the great dragon is discussed in Revelation, they're talking about the emperor. But you don't write the emperor if you want to live. So you use colorful language. It's kind of like talking around when your children are around. Mom and dad come up with a whole lot of creative ways of saying it so the kids don't understand. That's the way it was done for the Christian church amidst the Roman Empire. And so you hear John's frustration and thrilled in his agony by how God would ultimately come and wipe out the evil empire of the Romans cast doubt the dragon, destroy the, the vileness of evil that had taken over because the Roman Empire just wasn't an evil earthly empire. John believed that there was a cosmic evil in this world that had to be destroyed because that evil was using and manipulating the Roman Empire to destroy the truth that is the Christian church. So you read 20 chapters of all of this colorful, interesting, bizarre stuff. Mostly frustration and pain, wanting to get retribution. And then it stops. And you turn to chapter 21. And I know in Revelation I have to read it in the NRSV, because that's what's in the pew, but I don't know that to be. I, th this passage is better in the King James. It's actually more accurate, surprisingly. And John, after all of those chapters of frustration, lays out why he remains faithful when the Roman Empire and the God of the Emperor that seems so much stronger is actually nothing in comparison to the one true God. It's the same argument John was having that centuries later the Jewish people would have at the Holocaust. Is there a God when 6 million Jews and 13 million people can die in a concentration camp? It's the same question that's being asked today when you go to Africa and you see small children being placed in the military because they're easily manipulated, they're fearless in their youthful ignorance, 
and they're being trained as killers four feet tall. It's that kind of destructive force where you ask, where is God when you see human trafficking with young boys and girls being horribly treated? And you say, how can there be a God in a world that's so despairing, sad, and evil? And the answer comes in chapter 21 of the book of Revelation, verses 1 to 6. I'm a little frustrated with the lectionary. It only went to five. Leave it to the lectionary to leave off the most important verse in the entire Bible. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I want you to think about what that statement just kind of reads. You probably missed it as I read it. Brand new. If you were suffering, you'd want to hear about something new. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. What that meant was that Jesus was coming, God through Jesus Christ, coming. Heaven isn't a place where we go. Heaven is coming down to us in the final ending the final culmination and climax of the great religious movement that becomes the new universe. It isn't that we go there, it's that it comes here. Like a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with humanity, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Imagine what it's like. When you are so disenfranchised that they don't even know your name. You're just one more kid in a large military force. You are just one poor child made to do things no child should have to do. And all of a sudden, you hear this passage that you are special and made new by the love of God. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. It's gone. All the experiences of evil in this world will be gone. And the sea will be no more. Now in the Old Testament, and even before there was Israel, before there was any Israelite community, the Canaanites and the Sumerians who pre-existed the Jewish community believed that the sea was where the sea monsters and the chaos of all that was evil resided was in the sea and in the water. So for the sea to be no more meant there would be no evil. There would be no monsters or anything that could hurt you ever again. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. There's a reason why Jerusalem has been the most frustrating, painful, despicable, evil place with all the fighting and carrying on. Because it is symbolizes the fight between good and evil, suffering and hope. But it will one day be holy for all eternity. It symbolizes this new Jerusalem, symbolizes what will happen to all of us. Remarkably beautiful. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. The throne is the place of God. It was in the temple, in the holy of holies. But now that was a place that only the high priest could go to. Now it is open to everyone. The throne and the voice of God can be heard by all of us. And I heard a loud voice saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with humanity. That means the tabernacle, the place where God resides, is with all of us. In the Old Testament, any time someone saw God face to face, they died. But now we see God face to face. God is that close and that intimate with us that there is hope again. And behold, I make all things new. Can you imagine what that must have felt like sitting on an island 
with no hope, scraping for worms or whatever else to stay alive and exist. They dumped them on that island to die. If any of them lived for any length of time, they would scrape the ground to find anything to survive on. It's like the old movie Papillon on steroids. That's what life was like at that time. And still, they had hope in existence. Write these words down, for they are trustworthy and true. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Nothing exists without me, and nothing will continue to. In other words, the one who created the world will recreate the world in God's new image. But this time, thank goodness I, I scoured the book of Revelation, there is no apple tree in the new garden. And then the most beautiful passage of all, verse 6. For I drink from the fountain of the water of life without a price. It's the baptismal wine. 